Thank you so much for joining us. Welcome to the XR for Change talk and play on ethics in XR. Thank you again for joining us. We have an excellent panel land lined up for you tonight. Uh, my name is Archit and I'm the XR for Change fellow at Games for Change. And before we get started, I have a few housekeeping notes. Um, at the bottom of your screen, you should be able to see a chat button. And uh, you can use this chat feature to message out to the community. Uh, right next to it, you should also be able to see a Q&A tab, right? And you can use this Q&A tab uh, to post any questions that you want. And we will be answering all the questions in the last half an hour. Uh, I want to also remind you that this session is going to be recorded. And with that, I'm going to pitch it to the president of Games to Change, Susanna, take it away. Thanks, Archit. And um, thanks everyone for joining us uh, this afternoon, this evening, tomorrow morning, I guess, depending on where, where, you're, uh, where you're calling in from. Um, we're really happy to be having our latest talk and play uh, event. Uh, this is an event we would typically do in person, but as circumstances have dictated, we have been holding these online and it, they've been amazing conversations and we're reaching people from all over the world. Uh, so I'm really, really happy that uh, you all chose to join us uh, today as well. Um, we are also um, uh, going to be, I just want to talk for a few minutes uh, before I hand uh, the session over to our moderator, Ken Fai. Um, if any of you are not yet aware and haven't yet registered, um, we have our upcoming Games for Change Festival, which is happening online and for free for the first time ever um, on July 14th to the 16th. I think Archit is going to type in a link on... Um, on where it is, and I think there's a slide that he was going to put up, but it's okay if we don't do the slide. Um, but 14th and 16th, um, and uh, we're really excited again for the opportunity to reach uh, people from all over the world. We have an incredible lineup for three days. Um, in addition to our XR for Change content, you know, we obviously focus on games and impact as well, and we are covering topics from health and wellness to XR and games that are used in learning and um, how this medium can be used to grow awareness on, on civic and social issues. Um, we have some fantastic um, opportunities to meet and network. Um, we have a fantastic um, Meet the Funder series. If any of you are looking for funding opportunities, we have over a dozen different kind of funders who are going to be participating from U.S. government agencies to foundations to VCs. Um, so there's a lot of really interesting type of um, experiences and, and people to meet at the event. So please, uh, you know, as I said earlier to uh, our fellow, fellow panelists, the bar to entry is really low. Like this is the first time ever you can like join our festival from your home and it's free and um, you know, you don't even have to commit the three days, right? Find some sessions that are interesting to you and I hope you, hope you enjoy and join us. Um, the last thing I will say is we have another talk and play event on Tuesday. Um, that is with Games for Change founder, uh, Dr. Benjamin Stokes, who's at American University, and he's doing a book launch with MIT Press on Locally Played, his book called Locally Played, and it's about um, how games can help foster uh, playable cities, which is a really interesting conversation. So with that, I'm gonna pass the, uh, the mic over to Kent, who is a, a good friend of Games for Change. Um, a little intro on Kent, if you're not aware. Um, he's a producer of Voices of VR broadcast, podcast, and also a writer of XR Ethics Manifesto. Um, he's been doing podcasts for, uh, I guess, six years now, and you've, Ken's conducted over 1,500 podcast interviews. Some of them were at Games for Change a couple of years ago, which we were psyched about. Um, he's a philosopher, oral historian, and experimental journalist, and I'm sure he's going to uh, entertain us all and lead us through a really exciting conversation with an amazing group of people. So Kent, thank you for joining us and thank uh, everybody for, for participating today. I'll see you all at the end. Awesome. Bye. Thank, thank you so much, Susanna. Um, so yeah, like uh, Susanna said, my name is Kent Bai. I do the Voices of VR podcast. And as I've traveled around to nearly 100 different gatherings over the last six years, uh, I've been in, in conversation with the XR community, and it's from those conversations, actually, that issues around privacy and ethics started to organically emerge. Uh, and as I've done a bunch of different interviews and uh, about this topic, and went to the uh, helped to co-organize the VR Privacy Summit back in 2018, um, there's a couple ways that I think about it. One is that 
with all new technology, it starts to blur the line of our existing contexts and it creates new sort of ethical situations where we don't necessarily have the normative standards to be able to understand it or to navigate it yet. And so it's a process of trying to put language around it and to see how there's various trade-offs as you uh, uh, try to merge these different contexts together. Um, also, the issues around uh, privacy and you know, um, you know, blending together s certain aspects of what we have radiated from our bodies. Um, you know, that's a whole other area as well. Ethics. You know, I, after talking to a lot of people about this, the the, the whole field is vast uh, and infinite. I mean, it's, it's really impossible to try to do a comprehensive take in this conversation that we're going to have here. And so the best that I can say that we're going to try to do is have each person has their own slice of what they're looking at. We're going to have each of our panelists introduce themselves. And then everybody who's in the audience will also likely have their your own perspective of what you're looking at. And so I look forward to opening it up to discussion uh, and questions here uh, after about an hour of us talking about it and trying to cover as much ground as we can. Um, and uh, so with that, I'm just going to hand it over to the different panelists to go ahead and introduce themselves and give a little bit more context as to how you're connected to this topic of XR ethics. So Thomas, why don't you go ahead and start and then somebody just jump in afterwards. Sure. So um, my name's Tom Fisk. I am the editor of Virtual Perceptions, which is a VR and AR analyst website, which covers what's happening in the industry. Earlier this year, I published a book called The Immersive Reality Revolution, where I cover everything when it comes to immersive, where I dedicated also a chapter to the ethics of VR and AR, which in hindsight is way too short, considering how big this topic is. Um, I've been in this industry for about four years, since 2016, and I've just been following all these amazing people doing these amazing and innovative items. What particularly interests me when it comes to ethics is the use of our data. So how people collect data and how the data is sold and exploited uh, in lots of different ways, which touches on upcoming VR and AR items coming in the future. Uh, but that's my specialism. Thank you. Awesome. And Galit? Hi. Uh, so my name is Galit Ariel. Uh, my background is actually um, a very nonlinear uh, background that led me to technology. I started off as a designer of physical spaces and objects, moved into exper ex experiential design and strategy, and kind of landed again um, in, in human-computer interaction uh, focusing mainly on uh, augmented reality uh, that for me is the best, <laughs> the best immersive technology. Um, for me, what fascinates me with augmented reality in particular, but immersive tech at large, is um, the, the fact that we are really about to step into a new realm where the pixel, the neuron, and, and the atoms will, will become a, a new space. Mm -hmm. And you know, with great power comes great responsibility. And as I was um, interviewing people for my uh, master's degree or uh, research about AR, I was kind of alarmed at how many developers are admitting that this is one of the greatest technologies, but refusing to to create processes and and ethics and regulations that will also prevent misuse of it. So I published a book, uh, Augmenting Alice, The Future of Reality, Identity, and Experience. Um, I've been giving a lot of workshops and talks about it since I consult uh, for AR uh, gaming um, entities. Um, and basically, I just want for us to all have uh, shared reality and the technology we all deserve. Great, Kavya. Thank you. Um, I'm Kavya Perlman. I am the founder of XR Safety Initiative. Um, XR Safety Initiative started in 2019, and the goal is very, very simple. It's to help build safe XR environments. Now, why did, we, why did I start XR Safety Initiative? That is, you know, a whole long story, but essentially because I feel that I'm uniquely positioned 
to bring about this, this sort of a very much needed change in the industry and potentially produce solutions and by you know, collaborating or coordinating with different entities. And what makes me, uh, what put me in this unique position is a couple of things that happened in my life. Uh, one being um, just, uh, you know, uh, I found myself as the f um, chief, chief security officer or the cybersecurity officer for Second Life, which is all we know, we all know is the oldest existing virtual world. And uh, prior to dealing with, you know, security issues for Second Life, I also found myself doing third party security for Facebook during 2016 election time. And that was another sort of, you know, gave me a unique set of skills. And the biggest thing that it taught me is that how technology, if we are not proactive about, you know, allowing third parties or uh, use of data, like we saw in 2016, how data can be weaponized. And so now when I combine that experience with like what I see right now, what we are doing with XR, uh, there is a huge, there is a huge gap here that we, we need to fill in. And we talk about ethics when this gap sort of comes up. It's like there is a gap between, you know, uh, how do we perceive ethics? How do we address these issues? So I think those few experiences make me, and then I, you know, got connected to so many incredible people in the industry because my background being cybersecurity, got connected to the uh, co-founder of XR Safety Initiative, uh, Abraham Bikili. He was like the first person who actually discovered novel cyber attacks in virtual reality and is actually the only person at the moment along with his team at New Haven University who can actually prove what happens forensically inside a virtual environment once things have been manipulated. So this, you know, sort of uh, establishing the truth is something of a capability that we need to understand and have as things progress in XR. But yeah, there's so much more that we need to, you know, I can go on talk about, but, you know, I encourage people to learn about XR Safety Initiative because I feel like after one year of this work, we've sort of become this essential piece of puzzle uh, to navigate these uncharted territories. Great, and then uh, M, go ahead and introduce yourself. Hey everybody, my name is M Laserwalker. I use she, her pronouns, and I work as a cloud advocate at Microsoft. Um, so my background is mostly in experimental games, largely using non-traditional physical interfaces and emerging technologies and everything that's not using a controller or keyboard and mouse. Um, so that is often meant sort of making my own hardware, but it also means using uh, XR and VR and AR tech, um, including I spent a bunch of time doing research at the MIT Media Lab focused on using fiction to connect people with real world spaces and how can we sort of safely and ethically use spatial audio in public spaces to give people immersive experiences. Um, and sort of since COVID has broken out, a lot of what I have been focusing on is uh, sort of online virtual worlds and social spaces. So one lens of ethics that I'm particularly interested in is looking at how we can create spaces that prevent abuse and harassment and things like that. Um, I'm also here to sort of represent the Microsoft side of things. I think it's interesting to have a large tech company with some representation in this panel. Um, although as I'm sure we'll get into, Microsoft is a bit weird compared to talking about a Facebook or a Google because we don't really have a monolithic VR AR strategy. We have HoloLens, we have Windows Mixed Reality, we have a bunch of developer tools and cloud services. There is less like one way that Microsoft views ethics in VR. Great, so I know we had a chance to do a bit of a uh, pre-discussion where we kind of mapped out a little bit of the topics that we're interested in. I think what might be a good approach is to kind of go through each person's sort of topic areas. And I'll give a brief summary before we dive in, just so that everybody kind of knows that as we go from each person, I'll sort of hand it over to them to kind of make an opening statement. Um, and But before we do that, one other thing I just wanted to mention just to sort of help set a broader context is that right now uh, there's open questions around what laws need to be set uh, at, at a, a global scale. There's aspects of what each company has to do to be able to set their privacy policies for where they set those boundaries. But for most of the people that are probably here, it's more of like an education. So learning about what the risks are. So as designers, how do you create the most ethically uh, embodiment, uh, ethically aligned embodiment of XR design, but also as consumers, 
what do we need to push back, uh, whether it's by our voting dollars and supporting certain things or uh, you know, new economic models or whatnot. So I think that's also important just to say that there's gonna be a lot of different vectors in which like action could be taken as we think about this as a, a panel for XR for change. Um, so I wanted to just sort of give a brief overview of what we talked about uh, and then we'll dive in. So I know Thomas was talking a lot about the, the use of data and research uh, and lots of issues there about what that is. So we'll start there. Uh, I know uh, Galit was talking about like the business of XR, who's, who has power, who's in control. Uh, and so maybe dive into more of those sort of uh, larger structural issues there that I'll you know, let her sort of make that statement. Um, and then I know that Kavya, you've been doing a lot of stuff with cybersecurity as well as with harassment and then trust and safety and security. Uh, and then M, uh, like you said, uh, we'll probably cover a lot of the cyber harassment stuff there, but you know, I'd love to just hear a little bit more about this whole Microsoft angle of how this company kind of fits in, uh, especially with the relationship to government contracts and how the government's relationship to the people as well. Uh, so that's sort of like an overview. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Thomas to kind of, let's kick off with the data aspects. Thank you. So when it comes to the use of data, uh, we're currently in a society where our data is farmed and then used in multiple different ways. Um, the clear example, this is Facebook uh, with redirecting of ads and with pixels where it tracks our, all our online activity. My fear is the extension of that as we use virtual reality or augmented reality because it, the complexity of the data becomes um, more intimate. Uh, last year, um, they had some preliminary findings on the use of brain reading technology, which reads very simplistic instructions from the mind. The technology is very uh, juvenile. It's not good enough quite yet to do much, but give it a few years and um, Facebook will start being able to read what you are doing. And the reason why I'm cautious is I'm talking from a UK perspective, but I also know for globally, we haven't really touched on the issues when it comes to collecting technology with data with immersive technology, because there's so much uh, going on with that. So with that in mind, I came up with six principles, which I feel encapsulates what we should do eth um, ethically in order to make sure we are safe. These are, I'm not sure they'll ever be implemented, but I feel that in a utopian world, this would happen. Uh, first of all, there should be limited access. Regulators should control which organizations can access and use user data. So uh, for example, political campaigns would just have restricted access. I know um, ad companies are already uh, displaying when a political ad is happening, but uh, if I'm honest, I don't trust that at all. I'd rather just completely limit how much politics uses our data. I also think there should be transparent design. So the neuroethical design of brain interfaces must be open and understandable by regulators and agencies to fully understand what kind of data is collected. Because one of the key issues is a lot of people don't actually quite understand how the data is then used and then interpreted. It's a very um, oblique system. And in order for it to work better, it needs to be more transparent for regulators to take a look into. The third principle is understandable algorithms. So touching back on my previous point where it just needs to be open and understandable for regulators and agencies to understand what's happening. And then the next three principles are based on the users. Uh, I believe the user should completely own their data, completely. Um, it is not the companies who actually own it, it's the user's right to be able to own the data and sell it. I know um, Kent has also mentioned with his XR manifesto that he has the same views on this topic. Uh, it also should be open to users as well. Any user should access their own data to the broadest extent where possible. And then finally, um, I believe there should be active opt-in. Every once in a while, a company may send you an email saying, we've updated your terms, conditions. You may opt out whenever you want. I believe there should be active opt-in saying, your accounts will be blocked unless you read and understand these uh, principles, you must tick this. And the reason why I believe that should be the case is because a lot of users don't actually understand what they're accepting and how their data is being used. Um, those are my six utopian principles. Um, I'm happy, happy to hear what you all think about them. 
Yeah, I think that uh, I'll, I'll share a brief thought and sort of open it up for other folks to jump in. Um, you know, this, this issue of what data is recorded and what is captured, our eye tracking data, galvanic skin response, you know, there's going to be all sorts of information that is going to revealing all sorts of information. Now, in certain contexts, like a medical context, that's great because you want to be able to rehabilitate yourself. And so sometimes that it's contextual where like it's okay, but other times if it's Facebook having access to that, then it's obviously not as okay. And so uh, Helen Niesenbaum uh, has this privacy framework called contextual integrity that tries to start to map out how contextual privacy is. There's not like a universal definition where sometimes it's okay and other times it's not. So that's my initial take. Um, my other just thought, as you say all those different principles is that sometimes in ethics, it's impossible to implement a perfect design because you're always trading off one thing over the other. So what I'm really interested in is the different trade-offs or the dialectics of these things where you can have a little bit of this, but you're never gonna have like the, the, the perfect ideal situation because it's always gonna be uh, something, uh, some compromise that you have, have to do. So that's my initial thoughts, but I'd love to hear what other folks have to say as well. I think there's a, there's a really interesting question about how user freedom and choosing technologies that if you look at the web, like not all web technology was made, like we needed stuff like GDPR to make this happen. But there are a lot of things that you get freedom by there being choice in web browsers. If your web browser doesn't support the do not track header, you can switch to one that does. Um, if your ad blocker doesn't work in a web browser, you can switch to one that does. If you don't trust Google or Firefox, you can compile it from scratch. Um, and that is less viable in XR where you're not gonna make your own VR headset from scratch. And I don't quite know how to solve all these problems in context of we are stuck living in Facebook or Valve's world. And, and, and for me, I think um, I really like that what you said about being transactional, because of course this is not, you know, this is a system that exists because um, policymakers and companies and developers and users are all contributing to it. And, and this is where, you know, I love the fact that we talk about ethics because ethics talks more about norms than regulation. Um, and this is about um, how do we create a mindset that we, we prioritize and decide what are these trade-offs and where do they happen and whom do they happen with? Because I think um, we're only now waking up or at least not us, but uh, I think the wider audience that might have been a bit um, oblivious to what's happening is waking up. And uh, from talking and doing workshops with, with users, I do Utopia Dystopia users, what scares me the most is that most of them, especially when I talk about social media, are like, well, you know, what are you going to do? It's like Black Mirror. So we accepted the fact that this is the way it is and it can't be changed. And this trade off is the only way to achieve um, useful, uh, you know, useful application and, and prosperous societies. And this narrative is the first thing we have to peel out. You know, you have to trade your privacy for this. You have to, it is one mechanism that works in, in many levels, but it creates a lot of problems. So we have to start a conversation from the root of, you know, what if we didn't have all that and we could build it all again? What we would, would we do then? Because we can this is the truth, we can. Right, and I, I really admire that question, is like, how do we solve it? And then I wanna add my piece here because we have been looking at this very challenge for, I've been looking at it for almost like two years now, but as XRSI, as a collective, we've been looking at this sort of ethical issue or this overall data, privacy, cybersecurity, all of these like collective issues that touch I mean, we can say XR domain, but it actually touches a lot of domain. It touches healthcare, it touches education, it touches travel industry, it touches almost every domain because this is going to, we know that this is going to be our new web. And now we have an opportunity to possibly get this right. Now, uh, you know, Galit asked this question, how do we do this? And I see, and I have so much respect for all of the people on the panel and just outside the panel, 
trying their level best to lend some sort of a narrative. Some, or, you know, Kent was probably the first one and through Kent, I heard all these, you know, risks that have come about that have surfaced through the ethical manifesto. Uh, some people call it like the ethical dilemma and others are calling it some, you know, like, hey, uh, we need to have some more accountability, yada, yada. So after about a year, uh, we just about, I think it was February, uh, we brought together about 12 different organizations, uh, including some really, um, you know, key organizations that do cybersecurity work, people that are focused on diversity and inclusion, so many people that actually are involved deeply into artificial intelligence research. So, you know, and, and I can name all these organizations, but, you know, I encourage you to go to this other website. We formed this uh, sort of coalition called Cyber XR Coalition. And so what we did, it's like we brought these experts. We looked at this very problem, ethical dilemma and all these other risks that are, you know, we've surfaced them. We understand some of these challenges. Um, in fact, uh, Galit, I think earlier today you had retweeted something about, you know, about being a problem solver versus problem seeker. And honestly, Thus far, we have been problem seekers. And I think that is also what is needed for the industry. Let's be a problem seeker. So after seeking that problem, finding these ethical issues, we establish that we need a framework. We need a framework between, you know, public private entities, like how should they collaborate? We need a framework to teach our educators what kind of a research should they be doing, uh, you know, academically. Uh, we need a framework for users. How should they be aware of when they are stepping into it? Checking the box is not enough. So then fast forward, what we arrived at is there are some things we can take this as an ethical principle, but trust me, Google started as do no evil, nice ethics. That's the premise that everybody starts at. But then let's talk about how do we solve this? We need to now mandate these things. How do we do this? We zoomed out a bit. We went to, we took a look at, hey, what about journalism? You know, journalism has ethics. It has been around forever. But guess what? When it comes to taking a stand, ethical stand, about some political, whether to flag some tweet or not, you see a shrug. When it comes to whether your platform was undermined to, you know, used to undermine democracy, well, the very first we see, thing we see is a shrug. So how do we avoid this shrug? We make it a trust and safety issue. And that's what we did is if you look at the recent standards that we rolled out, the cyber XR standards, we tried to zoom out from just the ethics. Yes, ethics and ethical principles remain a key component, but we need to talk about how do we build trust proactively in these platforms? And when we start to talk about that, we encompass privacy into it. We incorporate uh, you know, ethical principles into it. We think about in inclusion of all, you know, minorities and races and genders and whatnot. So that's kind of what we did. And then we just kind of took the critical pieces, critical risks that have to be addressed and put them under a trust and safety umbrella. So if you are a CEO, let's say, you're developing a BCI platform, or if you are a de indie developer, you can use this sort of a you know comprehensive set of uh, risks, like it's a list of risks, and look at it like, okay, these are the 10 things that I must care about. And now the next piece is to turn them into regulations or mandates and whatnot. So what we are trying to do now is build a bridge between you know, us and Facebook, let's say, between us and we're working directly with the ICO to like uh, work on some child safety issue, for example. So really just narrowing down different, you know, like the paths that we can take now and advise other people to take to solve these problems. Because we're all like sort of been in this problem seeking mode. And I think XRSI is like, releasing standards, telling like, you know what, this is one way and this is our way to solve the problem. And now we're bringing all these entities to the table to share more knowledge, to exchange these things and tell us, are we saying the right thing? And if we are, then you must adopt it. 
So now we create accountability. And I think that's kind of what, you know, I hope that that would be our major contribution is to have people become more accountable and implement these things and then just like talk about it. Cool. Well, I wanted to um, do one more quick round on the data issue before we move into like the sort of larger systemic issues of surveillance capitalism and the power that Galit, I'm sure, will <laughs> introduce uh, to us. But in, in terms of the data, I think there's a, a two quick points I want to make. One, uh, Tom, that you said the, the act of opt-in, you know, there's a challenge. The trade-off there is that every single time you go to a new experience, let's say WebXR, you have to give consent for everything all over again. And you sort of get this opt-in fatigue as we have from like GDPR. But not only is it for like every, not just to see the website, it's like, can we have your, your tracking of your eyes, of your, your, your head position? And so there's like this, how to deal with that consent and, and informed consent, I think is still a bit of a, and make it a good user experience. But uh, I just wanted to also just sort of have anybody that wants to toss out other information in terms of the threats, in terms of the information specifically around like, hey, if you have access to eye tracking data, we can know your sexual preference or, or you know, things like uh, gate detection uh, becomes once you have how somebody's walking, you can determine someone's bone length and be able to identify them. So this whole question of personal identifiable information versus like non-personal identifiable information. And with that in the future, stuff that is currently seen as non-personal identifiable is going to eventually through the assistance of AI become personal identifiable. So I just want to do sort of open it up to see if anybody had any other quick things you wanted to say about uh, data and the risks of data. So I'll, I'll, Tom, do you want to start or? No, by all means, you go for it. Okay. So I think, um, you know, the, there's a big problem in, in what data is, is being captured, uh, conscious and subconscious, uh, who's capturing it, who might have access to it maliciously, and, and are we aware of, of the big scope of what does it mean for us individually and as a society? Um, so I think uh, I'm not gonna go into the data per se, but I'm gonna talk about spatial computing and how that's linked to, to data. Um, because you know, Vladimir Putin said, he who, hold, uh, the, he who controls AI will control the world. And I say, no, he who controlled, controls AR will control the world because they will be able to control the narrative um, of what we see in the world and our perception of reality. And uh, also we're moving into a point where data is not just what you tap in, but as, as you mentioned, it's, it's me walking in a public space all of a sudden, me being in my home, just being, all of a sudden data will be captured all the time. There will be no opting out. And this is where we, we really have to, to, you know, kind of put a real cut now and, and put some regulations and some actions in place because before we know it, like 1984 has nothing on, on, on what we're talking about. It's just, it's, we are now at 1984 with cap smart devices. When we talk about smart and, and data capturing spaces, this is where we lose potentially all agency on how we perceive reality and how our actions are being uh, tracked and used against us. So I actually want to uh, respond to that um, because I agree with you that he who controls AR controls the world, as you say, because it controls what people see. My, my counterpoint to you is uh, in the UK, there's been a launch of a new company called Dara Base, which is targeting that issue. So what they do is they look at geo AR and they're forming a permission based layer on the virtual world. So Basically, they want to map it out where if someone wants to use the virtual layer of a particular location, then that means they have to seek permission from the owner. So they have to go through this particular system, which is amazing. This is exactly yeah. what we need. Um, we, we actually, a lot of companies suspect Snapchat already has this permission-based layer, but they've not actually publicly actually announced it yet. But Dara Base has been formed to um, help assist other companies do the same thing because of all the issues you've uh, targeted, which is such as what if McDonald's um, basically bought the virtual layer to do Burger King ads, that kind of stuff, for example. Um, but no, it's been worked on and I'm so happy it is. 
Do you know, are they, are they a for-profit company or are they some sort of government entity or who is controlling this lair? Um, so it's a for-profit company. Uh, it's owned by Dominic and he's a lovely guy. Um, I'm gonna have to do an introduction after this meeting, uh, but, but they are for profit and they're definitely a company to look into. It's called Dara Base. Cool, any other last call for any concerns around data? Um, I think one interesting thing to point out is on a lot of these cases, the solutions we're talking about are largely social solutions, which is correct. That is the way you need to approach these. But occasionally there are technical solutions as well. Um, like I'm thinking a lot about how Microsoft had some HoloLens research a year or two ago around the HoloLens is capturing all of these AR point clouds and often sending them up to the cloud to do all sorts of analysis. It is not very difficult to go from a, like a very detailed 3D mesh of a space to this is giving you detailed information about that person. Um, so they did a bunch of research into, well, how, how can we essentially anonymize this data? And they came up with some really clever ways of restructuring that data so that you can still do the same sort of analysis you need to, but in a way that they can't reconstruct someone's living room. Um, and again, I think there's still questions about this is research coming out of a for-profit company. What are what is compelling other companies to do the same sort of thing? But at least in some cases, it is not a given that if you want all of these like rich machine learning technologies that we need to make XR wonderful, like they can be built with privacy at the core. Right. And I just want to follow that up with again looking at it from a solutions perspective. So first of all, this technology, like collectively XR. I'm thinking of it as this perception manipulation technology. And I would have to sort of agree with Galit is, uh, uh, yes, uh, people who will control your perception or will be able to manipulate perception will control the world. This is a very obvious thing to happen. And now one thing that we have to admit before we look at the solutions, and this is something that we actually, rem I, I recall last time I was with the, uh, you know, at a panel with the Kent Bai, we talked a lot about the era of constant reality capture. This is a reality. We are not going back and we are not going to be able to segment where the privacy begins and ends at times. What we can do, however, is we can sort of define and shift this responsibility on the industries that are the stewards of our data, that are owning our data, even though we can say we are the data owners, but essentially it is their responsibility to secure them. Now, I heard a lot of talk, and not just me, but you know, overall XRSI, we heard a lot of talk about gaze data, pose data, all of this. So our very first order of business really was we formed a data class classification framework working group. What we are going after is what does, you know, what does it look like at the data structure level? So we're essentially in that working group trying to create a, you know, immersive API so that, you know, you can potentially take a subsection of your platform data, apply, you know, apply this immersive API and then be able to visualize your entire data life cycle. If you can see how data is being created, transferred, stored, and then basically archived and hopefully someday destroyed or has some kind of retention policy, and you pop that, you know, sort of into that sort of immersive visualization to a CEO, and you already see, oh, here is this transfer of data, but it's going to Facebook, and we don't even know what they do with biometrics data. We just don't know it, right? They take it, but we don't know what happens. So here is this black hole. So if you can demonstrate that to let's say 100 CEOs that are actually creating these things, then we start to ask questions. Then we start to shift that accountability. And then you know how in cybersecurity, we have this like reasonable security controls must be implemented. We have to at the very least ask for that reasonable security control in this black hole where this data is going. But until we can see the data, all this gaze pose, gait, and all of this, like now we're talking about the entire body tracking, we would not be able to have this conversation. We'll bitch and moan, we'll talk about gaze pose, oh my data, my data. But now once we have this sort of a visualized thing, we again, using the same bridges that we are building with big tech firms, we talk to them and say, hey, tell us now, 
Otherwise, you know, there can be consequences too. talk to the regulators about it, that these are the regulations that are needed. So we're looking at it from a very solution perspective and I encourage people who are concerned to join this working group because in phase one, we ran into a problem of like, oh, what is XR? What is VR? So we just like kind of standardize those terms. And now we're kicking off phase two under the re leadership of Diane Hospel from Mozilla. And so when we kick this off, this is the objective and hopefully at the, before the end of the year, we should have some solution where we can visualize all this data and visualize what is happening to our data and then color code it and tell people, look, this is what happens when you do your, you know, use this platform. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, I was just going to, uh, uh, well, go ahead, Gleet. What are you going to say? Make it quick, well, though, because we're going to okay. move on to the next thing. So I love, I love what you're doing, Kavya, um, but I um, just want to plant a seed, like a question. Um, so, you know, last year I, I was giving a talk in front of the data economy EU and, and GDPR was launched and they were all like saluting the fact that it's affecting the whole world and companies are changing their um, standards and then COVID happened. And for, for those who are not aware, uh, it was found out that GDPR was a regulation, but it was a recommendation in times of, of uh, crisis. And basically most, most countries applied contact tracing and all of a sudden all this work and all this thing was, you know, disappeared in a second. So I think, you know, to, to layer on, on the work you're doing, it's also like there's what if, 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 uh, situations that we have to to think about versus like the the day to day risks. Totally. Yeah. Very valid point. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good point. Um, yeah. The the only the last thing that I would say on this this topic is there's that uh, researchers that are in academia, you know, a big uh, line of research is looking at what data are available and seeing what you can tell from this type of data and extrapolating information about people. So that's like an active area of research that will help eventually be fed into hopefully at some point policy being made to be able to start to either limit the amount of data that are being recorded or what you can do with the data. Um, a quick logistical note for the webinar, there is a Q&A tab. If you want to ask a question, feel free to at any moment start to uh, leave your question or vote on existing questions. And then uh, here in about uh, 40 minutes or 35 minutes or so, we'll, we'll dive into those. Um, Galit, so you uh, wanted to bring up some of the larger, you know, uh, I guess, power issues, who's in control, maybe you could sort of make your, your argument and we can discuss it for a bit. Yeah, um, I think um, the problem, the problem of, of Excel, which is not a problem, is that it matured again in, in an era where we have like the big five or six or seven. And, and what is happening in, in my mind um, to, to regulation and ethics or the lack of them or the lack of applied ones, is also part of the fact that it's it's being actively developed and applied by for-profit companies that are also relying on on social media um, business models and surveillance capitalism. Um, so I'm I'm personally <laughs> quite concerned about it. Um, and even when you talk to to people that are trying to create alternatives, um, more ethical, more inclusive, uh, even art. Pieces. So, you know, speculative arts and experimental art, it is impossible to, to be sustainable without either trying to, to being sold to these companies eventually or as a, a complete strategy. And I think this is a big problem because, you know, when we talk about tech today, tech is not just an industry. It's like the butter that is, or, you know, the butter that is, is smeared on any piece of, of bread. <laughs> In, in industry, it's part of politics and policy. You know, we have, you know, the heads of, of tech companies are directly consulting to, to policymakers. Uh, it's part of our communication, media, every system in our lives. We are a technological civilization now. So it's not just an industry, it's, it's not even a common, it's something that is beyond. And, and the power and, and the, the drives that, that then drives not just the tech, but every other layer, like Kavya said, this is not just a tech problem. This is, you know, goes into tourism, into services, it goes into every layer. And this is the big problem. Now, you know, this is not to say that, that we can move into, uh, let's say, you know, I'm a digital hippie, you know, I know where I want to move to. Um, but, 
you know, of course, we live still in a capitalist society and a for-profit society, but I think the biggest problem is that we don't have enough uh, reward systems for those who are doing it better, that, and that's a big hurdle. You know, even here in Canada that has fantastic incentives for, for digital innovation, you first have to be a company that proven itself that has a span that made money. So you have to be big enough, aka commercial enough to be able to, to use these funds. Um, and also there's not enough uh, penalties for those who, who, you know, are not adhering with, with not just ethical, but legal but with legal, like violating legals. And I think these two edges need to be like highly, you know, elevated. And I think also on, on a personal accountability. So this is between companies and, and regulation, regulators, but I also expect a lot more from, from the users. Uh, I think, again, we became so compliant with like, yeah, you know, I'll just go, you know, there are companies that me as a professional, I refuse to work with, I refuse to work with them, you know? Because, you know, sorry, they're evil. They are evil, you know, and, and, and it's, if, it were, if it were projects that they would come to me and say like, help us change it, it's one thing, but help us, you know, amplify this and let's hope for the best for me is a big problem. And I really believe that change can come from the community of developers as well. We've seen it happening in companies like Facebook, in companies like Google, that people walked out and people are, thinking twice on whether or not they advertise on them, they participate in them and they work for them. And I think, you know, we have to take individual accountability as users and as developers to kind of like, you know, not be part of the problem, to be honestly on the right side of history. I think, you know, zero tolerance is, is where we're at at the moment or should be. Yeah, at the VR Privacy Summit back in 2018, um, you know, big takeaway for me was that the issues of privacy and the business models are uh, for companies like Google or Facebook um, of surveillance capitalism, those are in direct competition with each other. And so until there's like a, a complete new business model for how advertising and, you know, this whole surveillance aspect is, is done, then you're always going to have this tension between wanting to continue to grab a bunch of data about somebody and to be able to extrapolate information about them so that you can sell more ads versus, um, you know, the data sovereignty of your privacy of not, uh, and to be able to, to be, you know, in a, in a place where you don't feel like you're constantly having everything that you do or say or move or what you're looking at, what you're paying attention to being put into this big surveillance machine. So yeah. there's obviously Facebook, one of the biggest players, Microsoft, I'm really happy to see that they're starting with the enterprise and they don't necessarily have like a whole surveillance capitalism business model. Apple also has privacy, but you know, there's a bit, there's a, a trade-off of like, you know, like the HoloLens is like thousands of dollars and you know, Apple, you know, you may end up ha having to pay for that privacy. So yeah, Em, I don't know if you, like what, since you're inside of Microsoft, what your kind of take is on this sort of uh, tension that we see within the larger XR industry. Yeah, I mean, I think your point about us selling to the enterprise is a good one. I think sort of an elephant in the room is there isn't really a profitable consumer VR business. Everyone is sort of shoving money onto the fire in the hopes that at some point it will be profitable. And that series of incentives makes it even more likely that even if you would already be leaning towards surveillance capitalism, you're going to lean into it as a way of trying to get some return on your investment and sort of even even people who aren't platform holders, like if you're producing consumer VR content, maybe you have some arts funding, maybe you've raised some VC funding, but you're probably getting money from platform holders, not even traditional games publishers. Um, and I think a lot of like one way to view this and the way that Microsoft has done and now like magically shifting to enterprise is if you can sell something to companies that are paying a lot of money for that solution, like this is something that is out of the hands of normal people and they can't really afford it but it effectively sidesteps this issue entirely. And like Microsoft, if we're, if we're selling you something to help your business, we don't want that data. If we are building developer tools or people making XR experiences, like we do not want that liability of having private data. <laughs> yeah, any other thoughts on Tom or Gavia? Sure, I just wanna say uh, that, you know, we mostly focus on like these big tech companies doing, you know, whatever ethical, unethical or their best effort that may not be quite ethical kind of thing. 
but I think we need to take into account what Galit said. It's not just like uh, bigger uh, companies. There are smaller enterprises that are struggling. What are the incentives? What are the ways that they, they wouldn't just sell out? Like uh, there is a particular organization that just received like about $7 million in funding. Their whole business model is all about uh, incentivizing uh, data in XR. So uh, how does a company like that, uh, you know, decide that how uh, now, uh, now that I have this responsibility and all this money, I'm going to operate ethically. We basically have to rely on uh, the CEO. Likewise, there was another company that was just sold fairly recently for millions of dollars to Niantic. When I asked the CEO, he said, and I said, how did you make the decision of handing over data to these guys? And he said, well, I looked at everybody and they seemed very principled. Nice answer, but what does that mean principled? Uh, what, how, how does their third party security program look like when they do data sharing? Did we look at that? Um, uh, how do they actually intend to, or do they have it in writing legally, uh, you know, use the data that is coming in? We saw another uh, interesting uh, merger or like acquisition happen, which was Beat Saber. And then suddenly this happened in November and all of a sudden, magically, Facebook's uh, privacy policy gets updated in December. So I wonder what happened. I mean, there's just enough, you know, like this enough connection to make that speculation that maybe there is this data that arrived that somebody wanted to use and now they, you know, sort of updated. However, during this update, what we still didn't see is what is happening to biometrics data. So again, looking at it from a solution perspective, Again, this is like, you know, the, the standards that I keep talking about, it was our first attempt to give people that baseline. We said that if you are building, if you're doing stuff in XR, make it based on human centric design, which is based on like accessibility, inclusion and trust. So you include ethics there you give people some kind of a baseline to sort of follow is, hey, you got your funding, you got this, you're a small business, you're a bigger business. If we all adhere to this, including Facebook, including everybody, if we just draw this line in the sand and be like, hey, we need to th think about human centric design and we need to think about you know, trust in general, are we building trust by you know, exchanging this data or not? Then I think we can solve these issues better. We need some sort of a baseline and then we improve upon it. I, I have a quick solution that maybe Kavya, you'll agree. How about we take all the tax money that all the big tech companies are not paying, make them pay it, and then make that into grants for ethical and small businesses, ha. Okay. I, I, no, it's not I mean, possible, but a girl yeah. can dream. Yeah, no, no, no I, a girl can I, dream. I think you're right, though. I mean, this is what I thought when we started XRSI is like, it's not my responsibility to raise money for XRSI. We have now become this essential component. So that's my next step. I'm just going to start putting these research components out there that must be done. And hey, Facebook, Microsoft, Google, people who have billions of dollars, people who actually pay $59 million on, in a lawsuit just so somebody could shut up, they need to pay. They need to build these things. It's in their better interest. It's in the better interest of humanity. So I am with you. In fact, I'm going to call you and ask you for advice on this as I build this. We will. Yeah. yeah. We'll make those dreams come true. No, I'm so happy you mentioned uh, tax as well. Uh, there was a historian who visited the World Economic Forum and where all these billionaires come with private jets. And he mentions that uh, the real solution for helping the world is to make sure people t pay tax properly. And then he said, it's a bit like going to a firefighters conference and not mentioning water, for example. Um, but yeah, uh, going back to uh, Kavya's other points when it comes to thinking about other companies, I totally agree. You acquire companies, you shift the policies to make sure you get to do these other things. And it's very scary. And it happens very regularly. And I think yeah. I just want to cap off with mentioning one company, which I don't think no one's mentioned yet, but I suspect it's going to become a, like a hot topic. And that's TikTok. Because at the moment, um, the companies which are getting the most interest and insight is uh, Facebook owned companies, as well as Apple, as well as other big tech companies. But TikTok is very interesting because less people are slash interested or looking into it that much. 
um, yet they have such a grip hold on a particular age demographic all around the world. And um, the way they collect the data is actually quite scary because it's um, one of those platforms where a lot of fake information spreads very quickly with almost no regulation, which is why it's impacting a lot of people, at least particularly in the UK. And the reason why I mentioned in the context of ethics and XR is because they're also looking into augmented reality tech. And the, yeah, I, have to, I have to wonder what TikTok will be doing next when it comes to augmented reality, which is why I'm taking a very close eye on that company right now. Yeah, yeah it's basically like a, a massive spy machine in the globe. Uh, and I'd say in terms of like the United States-based companies, so a lot of the big companies, um, I'm skeptical that they're just going to like do the right thing, like without either pressure from consumers, uh, pressure from the larger uh, culture, pressure from regulators, frankly, in terms of how to give the, the whole power of the government um, into actually forcing certain actions. So I think as we, as we think about this, it's like, how do you come up with the policies and the legal frameworks to be able to actually push up and to start to mandate uh, more action on this? Something similar to the GDPR, but something like privacy as a human right and how do you conceive of that and you know, how do you enforce that at a, a governmental level? Uh, or how do you, you know, because right, you know, there's a number of different philosophers that have looked at, you know, different approaches like Adam Moore, looking at privacy in terms of something that you own that you could you know, like license out like copyright, uh, contextual integrity, which is like, it's more about the context or Dr. Anita Allen uh, talks about how you need to actually like have a paternalistic approach where people are not responsible enough to taking care of their own privacy. So we need to have the government take care of it for us. So it, all of these are not perfect. And so how to sort of uh, force action at the, at the collective level. Um, but I think that's probably a good uh, place we could, again, go on for hours for any one of these topics, but I wanted to kind of wrap up the, the, the rest of this round and then kind of open it up for questions. So Kavya, why don't you go ahead and uh, talk a bit about trust, uh, security, and uh, harassment, or whatever, which ones that you want to sort of focus on at this point. Yeah, sure. And, um, and I think I've shared multiple stories around it, but before I go there, I want to follow up with uh, uh, some of the points that were earlier made. It's like, how are we going to get people to, to be more ethical? And I think uh, there is like this threefold approach that at XRSI we are planning to take is we're going to start with awareness for all stakeholders like users, as well as, it. so for, to do that, we're gonna do a campaign of awareness of risks of XR going out to 29 plus countries, however many organization, 4,000 plus, and for that, we partner with somebody who already knows how to do that. They already have connections, so it's like, great. So awareness, awareness using Games for Change type of platforms, so awareness by, you know, partnering up with uh, girls who dream about, you know, this is a better model to adopt, and you know, those kinds of things. And then incentivize. Now we draw a line in the sand is like, okay, whoever will adopt and do this, we would personally, you know, like hail them or feature them on our awareness platform, which we are going to be rolling out next uh, month. It's a ready hacker one. Uh, so then once we incentivize these, once we draw this line, then we potentially can hope that now regulators, which, you know, again, awareness for them as well, can potentially understand and then have them build something more mandatory than we go into enforcement, do like a slap on the wrist. And hopefully we can then hope for like, you know, 4% of the revenue type of a GDPR like laws come out. The only sad part is that we are not able to get much of attraction in the United States, whereas other governments actually actually truly respond better. Uh, so that's the one piece that I'm like still thinking about connecting. Besides that, you know, there is uh, the aspect of harassment, bullying, all of this is coming to XR inevitably. And it's already is there. We see that in our gaming industry that, you know, if you are a girl avatar, you feel you know, sort of not comfortable in many of the cases. And still there is not enough awareness around like what, how should you be treating a girl avatar or why should you be speaking to a girl avatar in this way or that way? How do we solve that really is uh, yet another, you know, collaboration where we are partnering up with some something called this Gamer Safer, another organization that's really thinking about these things 
very uniquely using computer vision and artificial intelligence to create some kind of a digital ID where kids and, uh, you know, just like players or the XR folks are more incentivized for behaving better. And then, you know, define those principles, what better means, and then sort of like go about solving it. So we're just sort of taking this piece by piece by rolling out multiple programs without even spinning up too many apparatus. There is already, there is so much work going on, just connecting these dots and then just thinking about it strategically. Like these things happen using my unique experience when I was in Second Life or, you know, their virtual platform, Sansar. I personally experienced harassment. It impacted me tremendously. So like, I know that these things have a greater impact because it's, all, it's a very compelling uh, reality that we experience when we experience XR. So yeah, those are the things. I'm, I'm very solution driven this year. I'm just gonna monetize and solve and solve like problem seeking and then now it's problem solving. Yeah, well, I think the, uh, I welcome, uh, comments from everybody and all the stuff that Kavya said, but one thing that I'd say just in terms of the harassment is that uh, harassment is a challenging thing for one is that there's technology and then there's human behavior. And if like people are destined, like determined to be horrible human beings, I think there's only so much that the technology can do to prevent that once you get people communicating with each other. So I think we've seen that across Twitter. We've seen that in VR. And so some of it is a human issue and a training and a cultivating of a culture to sort of cultivate the right behaviors that you want. But there's also, there are things that you can do for, you know, the technological side with personal space bubbles, uh, uh, allowing yourself to block people or ban people, uh, to mute people. You know, all these are sort of like the basics in terms of what you need. But I'd say like, there's also a very interesting like trade-off because if it were up to me, I wouldn't do any sort of like uh, recording or tracking or, you know, but the, the reality is that like in Oculus venues, for example, uh, if you report harassment, then it's been recording whatever you're doing. So you have to consent to being recorded or uh, a lot of these social VR in order to scale up to the level that they do, they actually have to assign individuals like a social score. It's an invisible social score that's never mm. revealed. You don't know what your score is, but there's an invisible trust factor that you have that's essentially like a trust score. Uber. Oh. So like there's certain things that are actually happening behind the scenes in order to create a safe place. But I think that's sort of what makes it such a challenging ethical issue is that you have these weird trade-offs of like social scores and being recorded. So um, I think that's the challenge with this in order to like create a safe environments. There's no like perfect solution that satisfies everybody's like desires. Anyway, I just want to start there and kind of open it up to see what other folks have to say. I'm not necessarily, well, I don't know, but I'm not sure I agree that we need these sort of recording technologies and that at least they are not currently working. I have not spent time in a completely public VR social space without being harassed. Um, the times that I have felt safe have been when it is at a smaller event where the people organizing the event can treat it like an in-person event and use the same sort of social techniques that you would use if you're at a physical meetup to make sure that people are safe. Um, and like the model for using like recording video and things like that goes to places like Twitter and Facebook where it's much easier to scale up human moderation because everything is text-based and you can much more easily apply stuff like machine learning even if you're just looking at plain text that's faster for human moderators and even they are completely struggling under the load of the abuse and harassment on their platforms and I don't know even if we were okay with saying everyone is always being recorded in every space we're going to capture every piece of data we have and forget all of the other ethical concerns we talked about 20 minutes ago I don't know if that solves the problem yeah mm. and and to to add to that um I think yeah we need some some safeguards and some some spaces that we can like block you know the the trolls uh but you know if, if we think especially if we think about AR um we, we keep talking about AR of adding data and and adding features um AR uh is also a tool that can take out things out of your the public space so you know when when it just started um you know my first thought was like okay great so like fundamentalists they don't want to see women you know now it won't be on the women it will be on them and and i'm like yeah but what happens if for example trump supporter doesn't want to see people of color and pff, they disappear from from his his Brown, from from his reality so we're we're here in this like duality and that's another ethical thing like 
you know, to block someone, it solves, you know, the symptom, but doesn't solve the problem. And I think, you know, technology is great uh, in creating these roadblocks and, and protection gear to, to block the symptoms, but we have to deal with the hard problem of this behavior and this mindset to begin with. And some of this behavior and mind mindset is allowed or is sometimes encouraged by the platform. And some of it is something that we have to deal outside technology world and really have a deep, you know, root canal to take it out. You're right. You're right. And, and, and since we're talking about ethics, I want to add to it just one more sort of an ethical concern that is very least talked about, but it must be talked about. Uh, so we're talking about in-game harassment and all, but Google or YouTube bunch of videos where people are in VR and then people around them are either groping or touching or doing all sorts of things uh, while people, people are experiencing extended reality. So the point today I also want to make is we need to build a spectator culture, including what Galit just said. Is, this, this, is a, this is a cultural upbringing that we need to do for ourselves. And of course, today is a great way to do so. And then, you know, 50 other people listen to us and then they talk to 50 other people. That's great. But we need to do more and better sort of cultural awareness. We need to tell the researchers that, you know, or the universities, sometimes they're doing research and they have no idea whether this uh, professor, whether he could be a harasser or what kind of a guideline should they have. So these kinds of like, you know, First, we draw the line in the sand that, you know, hey, when somebody is in VR or XR, like, please do not do da 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 or do not harass and do not record. Like, all these things have to be instilled in a way we just, you know, culturally, we need to grow up. And this is an opportunity. This, this new profound technology, it is very scary, but if we use it properly, it's amazing. And we need to know what it is before, you know, we start like recording people or touching people or grabbing people, you know? Yeah, that's a really good point. And I think that is deeply intertwined with talking about the relationship between games and VR. Because I think like gaming culture is so fundamentally toxic. And you look at the harassment and abuse that happens, not just in games, but outside games. Like, I don't know if there is a way to save quote unquote gamer culture. And so there's a real question of as VR as this technology that has the potential to reach this much wider audience, but is very much now a lot of the time focusing on gamers who are willing to spend money on expensive PCs at an initial market. Like to what extent are we letting that toxic culture define what the overall culture of VR is? And that's a real problem. Yeah, and I just wanted to to jump in and uh, sort of expand on your point in terms of the public-private aspect, because you look at something like VR Chat, they have areas where you just go into public spaces, uh, and it's kind of free for all. Or you could create an instance that's just your friends, and you have more of an invite only, or you could start to have like your friends of the friends start to come in. And so there's, I'd see that there's this dialectic between like those private spaces where you have control over who's in those spaces versus the, like the public square. I guess part of my concern as well is like, what does public space look like in the future? If everything in order to be safe is like totally private, then how do you actually get like away from the filter bubble aspect of just sort of like radicalizing everybody in terms of like never having anybody that you encounter online that has any different perspectives from you. And so, yeah, like there's like these larger things to, we've already have these filter bubbles that have been generated by social media uh, and then as we have physical gatherings within virtual reality, then then how do we, you know, cultivate and, and create, like maybe there there are sacrifices we do have to make when we are in these public spaces in order to make them safe, but we have the option to be in the private spaces as well. So that's, that's some of the stuff that comes up when I hear uh, some of those things that's already happening in the VR as well. Um, cool. Well, uh, Tom, did you have anything else you wanted to add in before we move on to the, the final topic? Um. I, I, one thing I wanted to say, as I saw in the chat, Juliana says, what would you like allies to do in to support uh, better behavior in these public spaces, which Kavya has been talking about? Um, it's very tricky. I was talking to lots of people from the uh, Educators in VR Summit, uh, because there's a very tight group of people who work in alt space, and it, they explore how to treat others in these immersive spaces. And 
Um, a lot of it comes down to two things I found. Uh, one is to call people out of public spaces, which is very similar to what happens in real life. I just need to call out bad behavior and in a constructive way. The second thing I've seen, which is, uh, it's, gonna, it's gonna touch on the XR manifesto again, um, the avatars you use. The avatars you use really define how people react to you for better or worse. And it's going to be a big, big, big topic to explore uh, how you portray yourself in these spaces because um, some women have found that more people listen to them when they are male bodied, which is awful. And that should never happen, but it's been recorded to happen. And I guess one thing we need to explore is uh, creating a framework within these immersive spaces where a lot of these biases in real life do kind of spill over into these very intimate uh, spaces. And how do we, how do we as a community build together to solve these issues? And I feel the solution does come down to how active a community is to make sure they improve. Mm. Yeah, the, the code of conduct, I think every, every VR application has a code of conduct and it's, a, it's like a design challenge. Like how do you ramp up all of your uh, uh, members that are using the app on what the rules are and how, how are those rules moderated and enforced? So that's sort of like, uh, I know there's different approaches that VR chat uses, Rec Room, so yeah, but an alt space as well. Uh, so yeah, let's move on to the final topic and then we'll open it up to a Q and A. So M, you're at Microsoft, a, a big company that has lots of uh, government contracts. And so there's, you know, working with the military and the ethics around like uh, using XR technology for military training. The military has been involved since the very beginning of XR uh, with flight simulators and the sort of Damocles being funded by DARPA and Tom Furness and uh, the Air Force. So they're like the whole history of XR and VR and AR is tightly bound into the military. Uh, but I'd like to just hear you say whatever you want about your perspective of being inside of Microsoft and some of the ethical issues that you see uh, with a company that's as big as Microsoft. Yeah, um, I think the military thing is tricky. But like, what I can say about that is there is like there are limited teams at Hololens working with the military that I am totally divorced from, um, and I know that we have sort of ethical. We have a larger ethics group that works with them and brings in outside subject matter experts to try to figure out who who are we engaging that should be engaging with them. Um, on a personal level, sort of, I would note, it is not just that the history of XR is intertwined with the military, but in many ways, the history of computing. Like we would, we would not be communicating here over the internet if not for DARPA. Um, and so like I grapple a lot with, you know, even as I personally would not want the things that I build to be used for military purposes, military funding has directly led to a lot of the things that I use in my day-to-day -day life. And that is something that is really tricky to grapple with in a way that is, more abstracts than say, you know, should 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 X tech products have an ICE contract or not? Um, so yeah, that is that is one thing. Um, I think I think to the larger ethical point though, I think I touched on this a little bit. That for the most part, like what Microsoft is doing in XR is selling to companies rather than selling to consumers, which completely shapes the model. Like other than alt space is one thing. Alt space shares a lot of the same concerns as VR chat and all these harassment and privacy issues we were just talking about. But for the most part, when when my XR thing is a tool that developers are gonna use that customers are never gonna see, that really changes the calculus. Like the data we're storing, we don't wanna own it. It is a liability. Um, we don't really have to think about a lot of these same privacy issues or ethics issues that other people do, which is a very privileged position to be in. <laughs> Well, I'll ask one more other question and, and also invite other people if they want to either ask you a question about what they want to know about Microsoft or have other comments about what we've talked about. Uh, but since Microsoft is such a big company and with XR being so new and, you know, how to navigate these ethical dilemmas, like how has Microsoft internally started to have discussions around ethics and um, how are ethics embedded into the designs themselves? Like how does that relationship between the ethical frameworks and the actual implementation of the design, how does that conversation take place? Yeah, I, I wish there was a more unified answer. I think one answer is that Microsoft is a very, very large company. And so it is often difficult for different parts of the company to talk to each other. So like there is, there is this sort of 
formal ethics team that I mentioned, but for the most part, like I would love it if the people on the HoloLens team and the Windows Mixed Reality team were directly having conversations about the same things they are facing on a day-to-day -day basis. It is possible that I am just in a completely other arm of the company and those conversations are happening. But the perception I have is that any of these discussions of ethics are happening within individual product teams. Um, and the sense I have gotten is they do definitely exist. Like, I don't, I don't know if I'm allowed to talk to specifics, but I can think about a lot of specific products around machine learning where I have been in the room having discussions about, you know, this is a thing that we built a prototype of it. This probably shouldn't exist. Maybe we shouldn't actually sell this as a customer facing feature. And like that has given me, like as someone who is relatively new to working at large megacorps, um, it has given me great hope to see that these conversations are happening, even if it is at a micro level rather than some unified framework across the entire company. Hmm. Anyone else have any comments or questions? For I have a question for M that you can't probably answer. Do you, do you <laughs> bring it on. Can, can you bring like, do you have an example? Like, do you know about like a concrete case where, you know, a product that would have made money that was a good product, but ethically ambiguous was not released from um, Microsoft? Like, I do not have a good answer. I, again, part of that is being so relatively new to the company. Um, I can think, thing like I'm thinking of a very specific example where it is not a product, but a product feature mm -hmm. that did ship. And I don't think, I don't think we have pulled that feature yet, but, but like the, the fight is ongoing. And I think we are very close to having that no longer be a thing that you can actually use or pay for, even though it shouldn't have shipped to begin with. <laughs> Because, because I'm a Mac person and I really want to love Microsoft <laughs> and my mind on, because uh, I really think that Microsoft, at least publicly or as a consumer, have really uh, voiced out and, and kind of like applied a lot of things that I really respect and didn't expect to. Um, so make me, make me love you. Well, I'm going <laughs> to say something. Tell me whenever it happens. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say something in favor of Microsoft and against Apple is that in the past, Microsoft used to take on open standards and try to own them and kill them, which, uh, you know, Internet Explorer is probably one of the greatest examples of that. But eventually, you know, that shifted. And because Microsoft missed the boat on the mobile revolution, you had Apple with iPhone and Google with the uh, Android. Microsoft's been forced to really take this really pluralistic open source, like they own GitHub. They're like probably the most open source company out there now. And who is trying to own and kill open standards is Apple, who does not implement like the web, uh, web standards. They try to own everything. I mean, actually, they're quite bad when it comes to promoting open standards uh, and forcing everybody to go through their, uh, their app. So that, there's been a huge shift uh, that I've watched in my sort of tech career where Microsoft was the bad guy and now they're the good guy and Apple arguably, and I mean, they're, yeah. Apple is a good guy on privacy, but when it comes to closed walled gardens and promoting like open ecosystems, like Apple's like one of the worst. Yeah, so Microsoft is now the single largest contributor to open source on GitHub more than any other large tech company. Um, and having been privy to sort of public conversations with say the TypeScript team, like the, the old mantra of embrace, extend, extinguish, it seems like extinguish is no more. Um, and even just on my spatial computing team specifically, we have multiple members in the W3C web VR group and sort of everything right now with new Microsoft seems to be towards how can we embrace the community? How can we put standards? Like our, our like on the wall company motto is about empowering everyone to do more. And like that is, that is silly, that is corporate speak, but also that comes back to our goal is not to own what you are doing our goal is to help you the ways that we can, and hopefully that will benefit us. <laughs> cool, any other last thoughts, uh, comments, or questions about Microsoft and big tech companies? Um, um, I, I, only, I only want to um, touch on the ethics behind helping military organizations, but which in turn speeds up technological development. Um, I, gu I guess, I share, I share the opinions of everyone else in the panel. I feel that I also feel very uncomfortable with that. 
where our biggest and greatest innovations do co- tend to come from investing and looking into technology. And the same is happening with um, VR and AR as well. I've been following um, Microsoft closely with what they're doing with the uh, US Army and all their new goggles, because the, um, the, they actually renamed the goggles to something which is beyond HoloLens because it's so different now to what the HoloLens actually is because of this tight connection they have with the Army. Um, I, I get. I, I lean towards um, no. I, I'd much rather. I think we reached a point of development where um, U.S. tech companies can develop without the need of like uh, helping out military contracts. But that's just a very personal opinion, and I'm sure others might share my view on, in this panel as well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was. And it, it, I wonder if it comes down to forty million dollars. Just saying. <laughs> it's like, I don't know if somebody would just give away $40 million just because they wanted to be ethical and not wanted to be called out. Uh, it all comes down to money. People are taking risks of very grave magnitude. And they know that even with the worst of the regulations, GDPR, even with their 4% revenue, even with all of these things, if all they have to pay is like, X billion amount of dollars. Okay, lunch money here. This is something that we have seen in cybersecurity privacy industry all the time. And it's gonna it's gonna continue to happen. Uh, it's it's money that's driving all these decisions. Oh no, I know, but that's the nature of ethics, isn't it? We know that there's like um, capitalist gains from it. We just wish it wasn't the case. That's ethics in a nutshell. Yeah. And there's also and when I was at the International Joint Conference for Artificial Intelligence, you know, uh, Max Tegmark had you know, try to get a bunch of uh, academics to sign off saying we're not going to support any sort of AI that's used in autonomous vehicles that are going to be killing people. And then, so then like when you go down that stack, it's like, well, this algorithm could be used for this use case. So therefore we should eliminate this, what, what they call dual use uh, algorithms. And so some people say that's a good thing to eliminate those dual use things. And some are like, well, this has other uses other than that use. And so how do you draw the line between like when you get lower down the stack of the research. So I think that's sort of the tricky thing, uh, knowing where that line is uh, and knowing like when you're gonna like put your foot down and say, okay, this is cross an ethical threshold that I no longer feel comfortable with. Uh, having technology go out there and, and, and take someone's life and killing them uh, automatically, that's sort of like, I think that happens more in AI, but there's similar issues that I think that come up in XR as well. Um, well, tell you what, let's open up for questions and we'll have like 25, 30 minutes for questions and for however long people want to hang around. Uh, but as I open up here, um, I see Lauren Slonick's uh, question has four thumbs up. I'm just going to go down the list here. Her question is, do you know of anyone working or researching how to articulate the qualitative aspects of the type of data you are sloughing off as you use XR and the quarantine data and the quantitative data sets that companies are collecting? And I worry about sentiment tracking. Um, I'll open it up. I've, I've got an answer, but I'll open it up to see if anyone has anything to say. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll sort of add what I know and then have other folks. So I know there's actually a lot of researchers. I know Jeremy Balenson. Oh, well, first to sort of uh, maybe recast what qualitative aspects. I think what I think what I take that to mean is that you you take a lot of numbers and abstract data and you're extrapolating meaning out of it. So you look at your facial expressions and you're saying they're feeling happy, they're feeling sad. Um, or they're able to do what um, Facebook and Cambridge Analytica did with um, the psychographic profiles where you take a bunch of data and you basically come up with personality profiles. So the stuff that, like I think most of the stuff, the research that's out there is looking at things like giving your eye tracking data, you're able to determine what people are interested in, what their sexual preferences are. Um, I know that the VR Privacy Summit, Jeremy Balenson sort of did a recap of, of a lot of that data. Um, and I know that uh, Jeremy's also been working on that as a, as a research topic as well. But I think generally there's, there's a lot of different researchers that are trying to, to look at what uh, you can take from immersive data and what kind of conclusions you can ex- extrapolate that from that data set. And I'll invite both uh, the panelists to share any more pointers people have or in the comments if people want to uh, point yeah. to Stuff. All the big tech companies have their own research labs, <laughs> squads that are doing just that. So here's an answer. You know. Yeah, a lot of that for the research labs is probably you know, 
their research labs are not, they, they choose to publish sometimes at SIGGRAPH and other things when it's sort of palatable, but there's certainly a lot of <laughs> stuff that's not as privacy friendly, let's just say, that's probably been happening. That's probably been happening a lot behind closed doors. So that's for sure true. Anybody else uh, wanna have anything to add on that? I know it's not really uh, research per se, but you know I would mention that again the XR uh, data classification framework working group, and so we're trying to bring in researchers who have these sort of answers. We're trying to you know have conversations with companies like Toby or Cognitive 3D, Bad VR, and ha use their sort of uh, you know resources to put together some sort of a framework to understand like how how this data could be profiled potentially. Cool. Next question. For, for, oh, I don't know. If, was that somebody jumping in? Quickly, yeah. I just want to say, like, I think the point that a lot of this research is happening completely behind closed doors at large companies means that a lot of the things we've been talking about are difficult. Like, they are not necessarily solutions to those problems. Like, having having a very public ethical framework in order for that to actually stop, you know, someone like private Facebook or Google research teams from still doing the unethical research that needs either much more stringent regulations than I think we've been talking about yeah. or making a meaningful impact on the opinions of the employees actually working there for them to be able to say, no, what we are doing is not right. All right. So uh, Sedant Patil asked a question, how can privacy and security be made profitable? What would make that an important consideration for those businesses which make profit-driven decisions uh, or don't care about ethics? Is it possible? You might have a hop in for this one. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Um, I believe um, the, well, the natural answer is Apple. Um, they've absolutely made a business model for, for privacy. That, what, that has been their marketing drive for the last few years. They've seen what's been happening with Facebook and they're like, let's capitalize on that. And the whole deal has been around privacy. And it's worked wonders for them because a lot of the way they make money is not actually using user data. But touching on Kent's point, uh, it caused them other issues, which is their walled garden. They're very difficult to work with, uh, which is why there's a lot of issues when it comes to building products for Apple. But absolutely, that's, <laughs> that's the company I can think of. Um, I saw M, you nodded your head vigorously when I said that. I'm sure you have a, an opinion. Um, I mean, I, I agree with most of what you said, but yeah, I, and I, a thing that specifically worries me about Apple though, is they, they have currently found privacy and security to be a strong business point because they are the only company doing it. And right now it is a thing that people care about. And if either of those two variables changed, like when everything is still guided by the hands of the market, who knows, like Apple might not be the privacy company a year or two from now. Hmm. Uh, my answer I, to, oh, go ahead. Right. I, I have to agree and disagree, but I think Apple started with privacy before it became such a popular, they, they integrated Absolutely. it before, but it definitely, you know, they have been consistent and persistent and went to, to great length, length to, to, to protect their users, even in mm -hmm. court, even against the, the U S government. So on that, you know, I, I can't, I can't foresee unless, you know, a black swan, you know, I can't foresee it like being not part of their their core values in developing products, personally. Yeah, there's actually a lot of conflict between privacy and the open web and WebXR. And so they'll make arguments for privacy in order to avoid implementing the open web XR technologies, which is like an interesting thing that is happening there. For me, I don't, I actually don't think it can or should be made profitable. I think it's actually a bad model that you have to pay for privacy. I think that privacy should be a human right that needs to be at a more foundational level of our institutions that are demanding privacy because uh, it shouldn't be something that we by default have to give away in order to get access because privacy, mortgaging our privacy is artificially bankrolling a lot of technology, which is great for technological evolution, but it's horrible for the future of privacy. So I don't actually think it should be profitable. I think it should be just a human right and we should figure out how to have everybody do it. Uh, now that's certainly not the case, so. It, um, it should be unprofitable to do it any other way in my right. mind. <laughs> and I think part of it is that it's the culture and the people that value it that has the other market dynamics. But because the market dynamics aren't doing that, then we're in a situation where by default you don't have it. All right, uh, next question. Uh, Jonathan Og Ogilvy, um, Tom, 
started by saying limit access. And of course he was talking about protecting data, but my mind went straight to the Ready Player One concept of limiting everyone's access to cyberspace by closing down the whole metaverse on Tuesdays and Thursdays, like a museum that's closed on Mondays, forcing everyone to spend time in the natural world. This extends an idea and ethical game design, feedback loops optimized for addictive en engagement can be good for business, but bad for society. Jaren Lanier's 10 arguments call for a population-wide hard reboot now. Maybe we can get to that, or maybe, maybe, we, maybe we can get that, not now, but when COVID has a vaccine and the unmediated world is a whole new fun experience for people, do you think the fictional concept of a weekly or twice weekly hard reboot of cyberspace could be realized in actual reality in the next decade? Mm -hmm. Answer that is no. <laughs> Well, I <laughs> <laughs> not not hard, not enforced, but anyway, I'll hear well, well, people's. Well, we have already regulations about limiting screen time for for um, minors and kids because you know uh, we we know there is an effect, a visceral effect of of consuming technology at large, and I imagine that for certain populations, um, uh, it will be enforced, especially for underage kids. Um, but I, I really trust humans. Um, I really trust humans to, to yeah, we're, we're probably going to binge it in the beginning, but, you know, we're weird. You know, we're never going to stay in that. We're, we're not very good in, in stabilizing, you know, behaviors, right? And, and even if you look at what's happening now, it wasn't a VR, AR panel the other week and the other month. I don't know what year I'm at. <laughs> and, and, you know, everybody were, were kind of like talking about like, yeah, you know, with COVID, all, all the harsh things, but look at like what it does, the beauty it does for AR and VR. And I prepared, pre-prepared with me a loaf of sourdough bread and I lifted it up and I'm like, well, this is the killer app of 2020. You know, this is it. So we want to believe, and, and a lot of people in the tech industry like want to believe that, you know, once we'll build it, they'll all come and they will stay. But I do trust that people inherently and biologically will find a balance eventually. There'll be a, a blip, but they will find a balance and they will want to, to reconnect physically. And I'm already seeing it. You don't agree with me, Kavya? No. You know, I think, <laughs> no, I think, I, I don't know. Like I look at no, no, the so, younger so, so generation. To, I'm be proud, that's all. I, I want to just hop in and say the reason why I agree with you is because I, I looked at World of Warcraft as a great example of an immersive world, which people kind of hop into, went hardcore into, but then petered out over time. And I like looking at World of Warcraft as a case study for these uh, worlds people to explore. And it happened exactly as you explored it, Gannett. It was people who jumped in, got a bit intense initially, but they petered out as they bounced it with real life appropriately. But I see Kavya looking to jump yeah, in with her I, disagreements. Yeah, I do want to explain myself though. Um, the reason why I feel that may not happen is, uh, is, is the current situation and the immediate it may not happen is the current situation. One is uh, we have this elevated need and want to connect with people and we are all cooped up in our rooms. Let's say we build this nice, amazing, compelling, realistic avatar, all of this AR, XR, VR. Um, what happens when these companies use the same exact thing that they use is the in, you know, inducing dopamine based uh, sort of you know, models. Like you, whenever you consume these contents, you feel better. So I have friends who spend about, you know, at, today when XR is not that great, but there are people who never knew VR existed, who now spend about six to eight hours in Echo Arena, who have uh, been struggling with the you know, feelings of addiction. So think about how you know, we are using, we're, we're literally, we have technologies now, AR technologies that track your you know, mental thoughts and make you feel positive. Well, in the wrong hands, that could happen, that could have adverse effects. So that's why I'm not counting on it because Freud said, you know, humans are inherently, if you leave them to their own demises, they'll destroy themselves. And that's why I'm like, you know what? I don't trust these companies. We have to prepare for the worst and because they are going to weaponize our information, yeah. it's going to happen. And we are going to deal with addiction. We're going to deal with all these issues in XR, which will be worse than the current digital yeah. ecosystem. I, I agree with that completely. So I never said I trusted the companies, <laughs> but I do trust the people eventually. And, and really, when I look at, at the younger generation, you know, the real young, not us young, but the real young, I'm, I am seeing that 
they are using technology more and more as a tool and they're more skeptical and they're smarter about how they use it. Uh, and they're, they're not so quick to adapt and swallow it uh, the same way that, you know, our generation is. But I completely agree. When, when you have, you know, addictive uh, triggers and mechanisms in it, then even if you don't want to be part of it, you're, you're triggered to be part of it. And that is something we have to, to solve for sure. Yeah, and I wanted to quickly jump in and point out, like, I think the World of Warcraft example is a really interesting one, because to my knowledge, there have been, you know, a small handful of people who literally died because they were so addicted to World of Warcraft, they didn't bother eating or sleeping or anything like that. And that again, that I think like the solution is not limiting screen time per se, like in China, uh, Honor of Kings, I think it's called Arena of Valor in the US is the biggest game in China and Tencent, the creators limited the amount of time that anyone under 18 in China could play it and it didn't really do much and they limited the time again and that didn't really do much anything that these are even before you get into AR technologies so many of these games and experiences are fundamentally like, dopamine slot machines like when you have people who are just peddling Skinner boxes like that is a that is a that is a much larger societal problem to solve <laughs> and, and yeah, I think it, it it goes back to the business model of like I make money from keeping you inside my my platform because the truth is that social media most most companies you know they're not tech companies they're advertisement companies you know let's let's give facebook the name it has it's an advertisement company that uses social construct to to sell stuff and to get your data and sell that as a commodity same with with google you know there's a reason why they're giving it away for free trust me they are and and still the most profitable company uh, so I think this is where like also the business model and the regulation around it and the taxation around it w could help a lot in kind of like diverting their incentives on how they want you to interact with the technology and perhaps protect us a little bit better. Um, yeah, from from destructive uh, applications uh, and subversive applications of, of tech mechanisms and game mechanisms. And I at least have some small amount of hope the way that many different countries across the world have been implementing rules against loot boxes specifically and like one specific abusive form of these sort of psychologically compulsive mechanics, which who knows what will happen, but that gives me some optimism that this is a space where, at least in some instances, governments are willing to come in and regulate. No, absolutely. Uh, I think loot boxes are the perfect example of when a country gets serious, they will introduce rules which really help. Um, it also is a good example of why how some companies try to fight back. Um, EA, for example, when fighting back against loot boxes, called them surprise mechanics. So I have to wonder what other companies will do when exploring ethical issues in immersive. Yeah, and the, the point that I would make here is that there's I guess uh, an implicit assumption that anytime you're doing anything in VR that you're escaping and you're not in relationship to other people or to the wider wider world around you. And I, I don't think that's a good assumption. I think that you could actually be in deeper relationship with other people. But I think the the ethical challenge there, like Galit was saying, is that like that from a design perspective, are you really just trying to hijack someone's attention and get them into this like sort of Skinner box hamster wheels to be able to profit off of that? Well, they're not really benefiting from that aside from just being addicted completely. But so that's more of the design component. But I think as individuals, we all have to kind of figure out uh, how we're in right relationship with the world around us. So being in relationship to the earth and to other humans around us, I think that's a big question um, that is up to individuals that you can't necessarily enforce uh, by shutting off the internet for two days a week. Um, all right, uh, let's go through some more questions here. Regarding harassment and cyberbullying, how could or would you enforce a penalization system or a governing body to make judgments on harassment. How secure and private could you make the system that users would understand such a system or body in place without divulging the processes? Like Lee says, we've only been trying to moderate the symptoms, not the deeply rooted problems. Um, a few quick thoughts that I have on this is one is that this is kind of like a, a, a truth and reconciliation commission type of thing. and. And, or it's a justice, like how do you prosecute and have defense? And so I'm skeptical of just having a singular governing body. Uh, that's like what's happening around the world with the movement towards defund the police. It's to try to you know, potentially fund it into more grassroots organizations. So it's not necessarily a top-down authoritative body that's gonna make a judgment about whether or not you were acting in a proper way or not. But I think 
it having it more from the grassroots bottom up. So as much as you can be in relationship of people who are directly involved and maybe deal with it directly, or if there's a sort of gaslighting or behavior that's going to, that's going to be abusive, that's an open question of how do you have some sort of like process to be able to mediate these different types of uh, conflicts and whether or not people get banned or how do you uh, have people apologize and make it right and have more of a truth and reconciliation model. We're still so early, like all of this is very theoretical, but that's just some initial thoughts. I don't know if others have any ideas or thoughts. I agree with I, you, Ken. And this is, I, I think uh, this is not going to, you know, be, we cannot create another sort of like a XR police model, but we do have to bring in entities that I would say, you know, because uh, XRSI's three principle, ethical, unbiased, and trying to build safe virtual uh, augmented environment. These are the type of uh, entities that we have to bring together and uh, have their expertise, their integrity, their ethics leverage to build a independent review board or something. And this is something we thought about when we were rolling out standards. We wanted to do something like monitoring and reporting, but we held off because we first need to just draw that line in the sand. But that's the next step is we are going to maintain a particular sort of a mechanism where people could potentially report to us what bad happened when did it happen and then we'll investigate and we would try to like help out like just yesterday a friend of mine reached out to me on linkedin that she's being harassed on many platform her research has been deleted i mean this person has nowhere to go so she, she reached out to me apparently like you know she's like hey you're a cyber guardian or you know like people call me that so we need to like create some sense of this trustworthy entity by bringing a lot of the collaborative people like you know people that are on this panel uh, uh, people like yourself can to create this independent body that will hold people accountable for that individual experience that took place in HR. We will have it. It's a hard issue. I mean, I don't, I mean, it's, it's like one of the biggest issues, but uh, Galit, I don't know if you had more thoughts. I think it's a much easier issue than we want to <laughs> to admit. Like we just, for me, it's again, like zero tolerance, like zero tolerance for it as a user of a platform, as, as, as a developer, as a spectator, you know, I'm, I'm looking at what's happening, you know, now in the world. And, and I think everyone in this panel that, that I've seen in, in social media have been voicing out, you know, like this is the line in the sand. I'm, I'm very disappointed from, from others that have a lot of voice and are refusing to do it because they're worried about, you know, their future career or their position. And I, again, like, I don't think we can afford it, it with, with bullying, with discrimination, with, with racism, with any kind, like if there is ever a time to draw a line, it's now. And I, I really urge everyone here to have zero tolerance you know, zero tolerance for it and call it out, call it out. And, you know, it's, it's going to be much worse if we don't like whatever consequence you think you will have in your career. Trust me, it's going to be much worse for you personally and, and professionally if you don't. And I, I totally agree. And I think in a lot of cases that's going to like, that might mean needing to move away from platforms. Like I'm thinking a lot about uh, Riot released their new non VR game Valorant about a month ago. And the executive director of the game, who is a woman, has publicly said that she does not play the game by herself with strangers because she always gets abused. And if the executive director of this game with millions of players can't get the political will to solve this problem, like if, I don't know how you, as part of a larger community that encompasses that game, I don't know how you salvage that other than everyone saying there are other yeah. experiences out there. We don't need this one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you're, you're seeing how in social media now platforms are banning Facebook and it's working, you know, th there are many ways to, to put pressure, you know, especially if it's a for-profit, you know, platform, there are so many ways to put pressure as, as individuals, as well today on, on the big players. These, these big companies, whatever, the game companies, they're not, they like to, us to think that there are this like, this cloud that can't be touched. It's Google, it's Facebook, it's Riot. Now they're, they're made of individuals um, that are worried about their reputation and their profit and people that work there that are worried about their ethics and their future as well. You know, mm. they, they are touchable, oh wait, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> Don't touch them though. <laughs> Without no, I think consent. you're right. 
<laughs> You're right. And I think shaming works. You know, we do that in cybersecurity a lot where people like, you know, don't close the front door and or just leave all these other back doors intentionally, unintentionally, uh, or talk about stupid password practices or, you know, lose a bunch of data. So we do that a lot in cybersecurity industry. We do some kind of shaming and, you know, have the community kind of yell at them. I like to call it like call them out because exactly. like, you can't shame someone that has none, you know? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So yeah, calling them out. Yeah. And just exposing them. And we are going to use, we, we're going to continue to use that sort of power of community, bringing other communities uh, along with it, because it's not just XR community, just like I said in the beginning, it touches all the domains. So once we create that sort of sense of awareness is like, yeah, the XR technology is being used, but look at your community is being put at risk because they're not following ethical principles then you can bring them also and add to that voice of calling people out. Yeah, you're right. Uh, well, this is one way we would be able to get some headway. Uh, two quick sort of complications of that, uh, just to sort of as a, as a devil, devil's advocate is that for one, when you have a closed wall garden, you do have the ability to ban people, but if it's an open decentralized system like the open web or a decentralized system, then harassment is still gonna be an issue that, um, the antidote or, or, or sort of banning people is maybe a short-term solution that makes things safe in that, that short term. But I think if you look at it in the long term, you can kind of look at it as the equivalent of, you know, sending someone to jail um, and exiling them. And what does it mean to permanently exile someone from immersive technologies for their entire life? Um, what is the sort of model for, you know, rehabilitation or, you know, or owning harm done or to be able to do other models. So I think like having a balance between the punitive justice, but also restorative justice, how do you integrate that into the fabric of the technology today when you can track IPs and you can ban people that is maybe addressing the experience in the short term, but I, I, I'm skeptical that that's actually going to change the root of the problem, which could actually be more than a, of a human issue than a technology, a solution that has a technological solution, I guess, is what I'm saying. Um, and like thinking about it holistically, of like what else needs to happen? Uh, are we going to put people into permanent exile because they did something when they were a teenager? And that's sort of like a question that's sort of, a, a, that's, that's sort of, yes, I mean, no. like the long term <laughs> that makes it more complicated. Um, but yeah, so I, I think in the short term, certainly, yeah, that I agree with people needing to be able to have the ability to just like any private business say, we're not going to, you know, have you here. But when you think about like over the long term, but also like public spaces mm. as well. Um, I don't know, Tom, if you had anything else to add, we'll sort of keep. Uh, no, I just share the same views of just calling out is the best and healthiest way of doing it. Um, my own, my only addition is um, I just want to quote Hank Green. Uh, Hank Green would say, um, we should be judged not by how we acted when we were ignorant, but how we responded when we are informed. Mm -hmm. I agree with uh, calling out people, but if they have a history, but they are good now, don't dog them based on their history. That's all I'll say. That's, that's something that like, games has been grappling with a lot more accusations of abuse this week specifically. And in games, and most industries having any sort of quote unquote me too moment. Like usually what happens is the people maybe issue an apology. They silently go into hiding and then six months or a year later just sort of come back and pretend that things never happens. Um, and issuing people permanent bans sort of maybe solves that problem in, in some ways that it's a clunky bad solution for the reasons sort of talked about. But I think like figuring out actual restorative transformative justice in online communities is a totally unsolved problem, regardless of whether you're talking about XR or not. Yeah. Wow. Well, I think we're we're at the time. Uh, it's, it's not, it feels like a good place to stop. Um, no. And Can we I know just have the question about Mars oh. and the space exploration, please? <laughs> well, I'm not. I'm not, be, like uh, waiting I for will, it. For like... Okay. I'll. Uh, I'll. Uh, we'll do one quick w one quick round, and then we'll wrap up. We've got okay. uh, some more uh, participants who's been hanging around. All right. So last question, then we'll we'll wrap it up. What do you guys think of space exploration and the hype or hope around moving to Mars in relation to our collective future, living with surveillance capitalism as a global community? 
Galit, would you like to have an answer for this? Oh, oh thank you, Ken. <laughs> <laughs> so I love this question because, because I think that the answer is within this question. If there's anything I wish for all the Silicon Valley moguls that want to go to Mars is I will do anything in my power to help them go to Mars. I think they should oh. all go to Mars and they can stay there and then we can stay here and solve all the other problems. That's my answer. Great answer. <laughs> um, I, I think the other answer I'll take from this question is an answer I think everyone on this panel will agree with. Um, the impression I'm just getting is we all just don't like surveillance capitalism and we should reform it where we can. Uh, I'm skeptical of colonialism um, and sort of a colonial mindset. And I fear that going to Mars is just going to replicate a lot of the sort of colonial mindset that we've had on the earth and that we should learn how to live on the earth first before we think about colonizing Mars. Uh, so that's my answer. And the test of the descent. The Tesla they sent to space crashed into an asteroid. It's okay. Send them. It's fine. We're good. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't think we can separate the colonialist aspects of space travel or anything from all of the complaints about capitalism we have all been railing on. Like, you cannot... The two are intrinsically linked. <laughs> Cool. Well, uh, I feel like that's probably a good place to stop. I mean, we could talk forever about these topics. And, you know, I just wanted to thank each of you for joining in this discussion, both Tom, Galit, Kavya, and M. Uh, again, this is a, a never, never ending topic that I think we're still going to continue to talk about and hopefully come up with more ways of making sense and making these different trade offs and try to, best we can, implement the most ethically aligned design that we can with immersive technologies. So. Yeah, thanks you all for joining us today on this XR for Change panel. If you'd like to add more such conversations, uh, please register for the Games to Change Festival by logging on to festival.gamesforchange.org. And once again, thank you all for joining and a special thanks to all the panelists for participating. Thank you and good night. Bye all. Bye.